Good morning again. Isn't this a great day to be alive in Jesus? I think I left my eyes over here. Amen. God is good and he's good what? And all the time. God is good. Hey, hallelujah. First of all, let me give a shout out and a thank you to all of you who volunteered yesterday and participated in our hallelujah day. Amen. Thank you so much. It was a great day. We had a great turnout. I don't know the numbers yet, but Brian, Brian's going to get them to me and I'll let you know. But we had a we had a campus full of folk yesterday and it was a great time. We had an awesome time. And those of you who served and were there to pray and do whatever you did. Thank you so much for making that day yesterday a great success. Amen. Hallelujah. Then I also want to give a shout out to the leaders from uh, uh, who attended the leadership conference last Sunday. Thank you for showing up. My, my wife said that that was the fullest we've ever seen the saints. I've seen the fellowship hall. We know that God is doing something and we praise God for him. Amen. Amen. And today is a very special day. Very, very special day. Amen. Today is a very, very special day. Amen. This is the day God brought into the world the blessing in my life. <laughs> Amen. On this day, on this day, yeah, at 9.30 this morning, that's when she came into the world. Amen. And I'm so glad he gave her to me. Amen. Amen. So our first lady's birthday is today. Amen. <laughs> Oh, what a joy, what a joy, what a day, man. Amen. We've got something special that we're going to do for her after church today. One of the things, you know, usually uh, on her birthday weekend, I take her away. Amen. But this year it fell on the weekend and on this weekend and on Sunday. And so she wanted to celebrate it with you. Amen. Amen. And, and so we've we got something special in the fellowship hall that we're going to be doing for her right after church. And we got some special sweets for you to participate in celebrating her birthday. And if you want to, you want to personally give her your birthday wish, you can do that uh, over in the fellowship hall after church today. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm full right now. I'm just excited. Amen. Well, let, let's get into the word. Is that all right? Because I'm full of that too. And I got, I got a group. I think God has just been blessing me. Come on, come on. Well, let's get into the word today. Uh, uh, turn with me, if you would, in your Bible. We're going to be looking at three passages of Scripture this morning. We're going to start in Genesis. We're going to start in Genesis chapter 45. But before we do that, uh, let me give you our quote for this week. Our quote for this week says, Behind every physical disturbance, setback, ailment, or issue that we face, lies a spiritual root. Let me check it out again. Behind every physical disturbance, setback, ailment, or issue that we face, lies a spiritual root. Don't forget, the Bible tells us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against spirits of wickedness in high places, against principalities. It's not that person that you got the problem with. It's the root of it. It's the enemy behind it. It's not the situation that you issue. It's the enemy behind it. It's not the, not the challenge or the problem that you have, and you keep focusing on that problem, thinking that you get rid of that problem. You need to focus on the root behind it. Amen. Because he tells you he has given you authority over the serpents and over the scorpion and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. He tells you in the word, if you will resist the devil, he will flee from you. Start calling him out. And start identifying what it is and start taking your authority and watch God give you victory in the midst of it. Amen. Because behind every disturbance, situation, setback, ailment or issue that you face in your life lies a spiritual root. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Amen. 
Amen. Stop yelling at your neighbor. Start praying for them and start rebuking the devil. Amen. Amen. And watch God give you victory. Amen. Amen. So we're in Genesis chapter 45. We're going to read a verse out of Genesis chapter 45. Then we're going to go to Psalms 32. Then we're going to go to Proverbs 21. Look, would you would? Let's, let's begin our reading. First of all, in Genesis chapter 45. You got it? Come on, do me a favor. Take your Bible. Hold it up. Let the devil know you're not ashamed of the gospel. Shake it at him. Let him know you know how to use it. Amen. Say with a very loud voice, I have the victory. I have the victory. And the victory is where? In my life as I apply God's word. In my life as I apply God's word. That's where my victory lies, in the application of the word of God, not just in the knowing of it. Amen. Amen. Genesis chapter 45, verse 7, reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. I'll give you the context of these as we start, as we get into them, but definitely let's listen to the verse. It says in, in, it says in uh, Genesis chapter 45, verse 7, and God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Genesis 32, verse 7, you are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. In Proverbs 21, 31, the horse is prepared for the day of battle, but deliverance is from the Lord. You may be, you may be seated. We've been in this series of messages entitled, You've Got the Power. Amen. Um, for the month of October, we've been talking about the fact that we possess the power that God makes available to us in order to live this life that he's called us to live. That power resides in us. Amen. And so the first week we talked about the feeling, which is the spirit feel life, which is the source of the power. The source of the power in my life comes from yielding day by day and moment by moment to the presence and in the power and the person of the Holy Spirit in my life. That's the source of the power. Then the following week, we talked about miracles, which are the signs of the power, because God told us in Mark that these signs shall follow those who believe. We need to stop get hoping for miracles and start expecting miracles because because miracles are not supposed to be the abnorm in our lives. It's supposed to be the norm of our lives. Because God says these signs shall follow them. And that comes from the power. Are you with me today? Then last week we talked about the sustenance of the power, which is healing. And we've talked about the fact that God does not just, he, God does not just heal physically. He heals psychologically. He heals emotionally. And he heals spiritually. Because the first thing he wants to do is get your mind right so that your soul can get right. And with your mind mind gets right and your soul gets right then he start getting your body right and then he gets your emotions right so that's the third sense of the power is the sustenance power to live that power is given to sustain us to help us live physically emotionally and spiritually in a way that we'll be light and salt and a witness of god's presence in our lives in the earth are you with me today so the day is the last installment. The day is the last message in, uh, of this series on You've Got the Power. We're talking about the service of the power today. We're talking about the source. We're talking about the science. We're talking about the sustenance. We're talking about the service of the power. The power, the service of the power. What was the power given to me for? For deliverance. The service of the power is to manifest deliverance in my life. Amen. For me to be delivered. From the, from the consequences of sin, from the control of sin, from the influence of the world, and from the attacks of the devil. God seeks to manifest deliverance in our lives. And we've got the power residing in us to be delivered and to walk in that deliverance. Amen? Somebody once said this. They said that faith for my deliverance is not really faith in God. Faith means whether I am visibly delivered or not, I will stick to my belief that God is love. Amen. Because you see, deliverance in God's economy, and according to God's definition, is not always the same as ours. Amen. Sometimes 
Some of these things are learned in a fiery furnace. <laughs> you praying not to go in. God trying to tell you, if you go in, I'm going to deliver you. You praying, God, keep me from it. And God said, wait a minute, if you go through it, I'm going to show you something. Sometimes this issue of deliverance, I need to trust God for his leadership of my life. And whatever he has in store for me, I know that it's for my good. So if it's through a furnace or a lion den or whatever it might be, that if I know he's with me, he's going to see me through. Amen. For example, the John Patton, who was a missionary to the Hebrides Island, uh, uh, talked about uh, one night while he was there in the doing the work in the mission uh, field that the tribe that he was trying to reach circled the mission statement with the intent of burning it down and killing Patton and his family. Patton and his wife began to pray. He said that night and they asked God for deliverance from that situation. When, day, when daylight came, he was amazed as he began to watch each one of those hostile tribe members leave the mission station, just simply walk away. He wasn't, he wasn't sure what happened. He believed it was God's answer to prayer. But a year later, the chief of that hostile tribe got saved. And during one of the fellowships that he was having and, ministry and services he was having with the, with the chief, he remembered the night, that night, a year ago, what they tried to do. So Patton asked the chief what kept him from burning the mission station down that night. Well, the chief was kind of surprised at the question. And he replied this way. He said, who was all them men that you had with you that night? Patton's reply, what men? Only people who were there was him and his wife, and they were praying. Well, the chief said, well, I saw hundreds of men walking around this missionary station with fiery swords in their hand. And he said, we saw them. We said, we better go home. <laughs> Didn't he say, I'll give his, he'll give his angels charge over you? That will keep you in all your way. In case you want to know what that is, it's in Psalm 91, verse 11. And Jesus quotes it again in Luke chapter 4, verse 10. God promises his protection in our lives and over our lives and even sometimes in spite of our lives. Amen? Because God promises that if we are his, he will work his deliverance in us according to his plan and purpose for us. You remember that story? You remember that story? You remember that story in St. Kings? when Israel was fighting the Assyrians and the Assyrian king was baffled because no matter what strategy he came up against Israel, they seemed to know what he was doing before he did it. And he became a little bit perturbed that he assumed that he had a spy in his camp. And so he was going to ferret out where this spy was. But one of his lieutenants told him, he said, King, we ain't got no spy. I can assure you, ain't no spy in your camp. I, I'm going to tell you what your problem is. That prophet called Elijah over there that serves Israel. You know, God tells him the stuff that you talk about in your bedroom. That's the one you need to deal with. So the king said, okay, then let's find out where he is then. So they found out where he was, and King sent his whole army to the camp where Elijah was. And when Elijah woke up the next morning, his servant woke up the next morning, when they looked around, they were surrounded by the Assyrian army. Servants went out and saw that army, came back and told Elijah, man, we're in trouble. We, we, the army's around us. But listen to what Elijah said. L Elijah, Elijah said this to him in, in, in verse 16 of that text. Elijah said, I answered him and said, hey, listen, do not fear for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Servant paused for a moment and said, wait a minute, that's only the two of us. There's a whole army out there on that mountain. <laughs> Eliza, Eliza said, well, I don't need to talk to you. Let me talk to the Lord. Isaac prayed and he said, Lord, I pray, open the eyes of this man so he may see. And then the Lord opened his eyes of the young man in the Bible said, and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elijah. You know what encourages me about that story? God's not a respecter person. 
<laughs> if he did it for Elijah, he'll do it for you. If he protected Elijah from the enemies that wanted to wipe, guess what? God will do the same because that's how God works in his deliverance in our life. Sometimes we, we keep, keep focusing on the wrong thing. We need to be focusing on the right thing. And the right thing is not to focus on how God going to get me out of the problem. The goal is to focus on God who, who's going to be within the problem and let him work it out his way. Amen, lights. I know that kind of went over somebody's head. But we're going to get to it in just a moment because in the text and the verses that we are looking at, God points out and God gives us some things that will happen for us and God will do for us when he works deliverance in our lives. God, God is a God of deliverance. And his power he has given us is to work deliverance, not just salvation for today, but deliverance every day. In every circumstance, in every situation, if I will put my trust in him, God will work out his, not mine, his deliverance for me. Okay. So as we conclude this message, there are three things. There are three things that God does in deliverance that these, these, these three verses that I read to you point out. Three, three things that God does in deliverance for his glory and for your good. All right. First thing that God does in deliverance, that there in deliverance, there is promised posterity. There is promised posterity. When God works deliverance, he promises you to protect your posterity. All right. Not only in deliverance is there promised posterity, there is permanent preservation. In deliverance, there is permanent preservation. You can count on the fact that no matter what you face, it's not going to take you out. <laughs> and then last and finally, deliverance, in deliverance, there is, there, there is paternal protection. Paternal protection. Your daddy is with you. Amen. So let me, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me ferret these out and, I'll, and we'll be on our way. First of all, the first thing that God works in deliverance is promise. The, the, the verse I read to you in Genesis chapter 45, verse 7, said God and, and God sent me before you. This is a statement Joseph is making. Joseph is making a statement to his brothers. This is, this is the, this is the time when uh, Jacob and the boys go to Egypt, you know, Joseph is making to say, do you know the story? Joseph, Joseph's brother sold him into slavery. Matter of fact, Joseph, early part of Genesis, had a dream, and he had two dreams, and he shared the dreams with his brother and his, his brothers, and then his father and mother and his brothers, and his brothers hated him for his dreams. Well, the Bible, you know, the story says, you know, he sold him into slavery. Joseph was 17 years old when they sold him into slavery. You find that in Genesis chapter 37, verse 2, that, that when those boys got rid of their little brother, he was only 17 years old. They sold him to some Midian slave workers, and he ended up in part of his house. And then he stayed in Potiphar's house for a few years, and his father's wife lied on him, and then and then, then he got thrown in the prison. He was staying in the prison for a few years. The baker and the cup uh, cup cup taster got thrown in prison, and, and they made a promise. Joseph made them promise to remember him when he got out. But when they got out, one got, got his head cut off, and the other got restored. They forgot all about Joseph. So Joseph stayed in prison until the time when Pharaoh had a dream. Pharaoh had a dream about, about cattle and the one with seven good and seven f and fain, and, and he didn't understand it. Then the, cu the cupbearer realized his, his flaw, his fatal uh, uh, problem. He had forgot Joseph. But so when the Pharaoh mentioned that he got his dream, the, the cupbearer realized, uh, remember Joseph. So he told Pharaoh about Joseph. They cleaned Joseph up, brought him out to prison, and he came and he interpreted the dream. Now, at this time, by this time, Joseph is 30 years old. Now, God showed Joseph a dream about what he would be when he was 17. Here now, he's 30. And God is now starting to manifest the dream he had when he was 17. God's timetable ain't ours. It's 13 years have passed. 13 years. And Joseph been in Potiphar's house and in prison for 13 years. And God then raised him up and made him second in command over the nation of Egypt. 
the most powerful country at the time and ruling over everything. Famine hits the land and hits the place where his brothers are. They ain't got no choice to run out of food. They got to come to Egypt to get food. And when they come to Egypt, they run into Joseph. They don't recognize him, but they run into him. Here in chapter 45, it's when they come to, Joseph comes to a point where he cannot take it anymore and he reveals himself to his brother. And when he reveals himself to his brothers, the first thing his brothers think, oh, he's going to get us now. But Joseph said, no, 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 no. He said, I understand the sovereign hand of God. I recognize in spite of what you did, what you did was God's will for me to get me where I am. So, 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 so you need to understand the purpose of God. And as he says, and the reason why God sent me before you, he said, was to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives from a great, from a, for, for a great deliverance. Listen, Joseph was fulfilling the promise that God made to Abraham back in Genesis chapter 15. When God showed Abraham and told Abraham he was going to have a seed that's going to bless the nations of the earth. One of the things he told Abraham, and he didn't leave no seed, he didn't leave nothing uncovered from him. He said, your seed that comes from you is going to spend one, 400 years in Egypt before I bring them back to this place that I brought you to and give it to them. And God was fulfilling a promise he made to Abraham, and he was using, and as, as Abraham's seed began to progress, he was using Joseph as part of that fulfillment of the seed, and now they're in Egypt, and God was about to do what he said to Abraham, that he would raise up a nation of people that will bless the nations of the earth. Why are you saying all that, Pastor? Because you see, I believe the same God, the same God that promised Abraham, that he will protect his posterity. It's the same God is promising you. He will protect yours. <laughs> no, sex take with me. He is, he is not, a, he didn't just deliver you just for you. Thank God he did. I'm grateful every day that he did. But I come to understand at this age of time of my life, it wasn't just for me. God, God, God sees and knows your posterity, your legacy, your future, what you have in store. God didn't save you just for you to get saved. He saved you so he would use you as influence in the lives of those that you would come along and have influence in. That seed, those posterity, those family members, those relatives, the people that you have in your life right now. He didn't just save you for you to enjoy your salvation and get to heaven. He saved you just like he saved Joseph so that he could preserve a posterity based on how he uses you and the people that come from you and the people that you have a relationship with. He says, he said, listen, that word he, in, the, in the Hebrew, he says, I will preserve. He means I will fix, I will stand, I will install, I will establish. God was planning, even through Abraham, to establish a posterity that would fulfill the promise that he made to Abraham, that I would raise up a people that I would use to bless the nations of the world. They'll come from you, Abraham, because of your faith, because of your obedience, because of your submission to me. Because even when Isaac showed up and you know he was a seed, when, you asked, when I asked you to give him to me, you, you was willing to give him to me because of your faith. I'm going to preserve your posterity because of your faith. I'm going to make sure your children are safe. I'm going to make sure your, 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 your lineage is safe. I'm going to make sure that even though they look like they're going crazy right now, I'm going to bring them back. Even though you think they done lost their mind and have no clue of what you're trying to show them or teach them, God, I'm going to save them for your sake because of your faith. I didn't deliver you. Just so you can be sure you're going to heaven. I'm glad you are, but I delivered you to use you as a means of an instrument, not only to bring deliverance in your life, but to bring deliverance in the lives of those with whom you will have influence, with whom you will have relationship, with whom I will deliberately place in your life on purpose for you to walk it out for them and talk it out before them and live it for them. Joseph, that you don't understand, brothers, I, I know what your intent was, but God had a different purpose. 
I know you wanted to get rid of me, but God was using you to get me to where he wanted me to be. I know you didn't want to see me no more, but God had a plan for me and for you. And he's fulfilling it, even though it don't look like it. It didn't look like it. The boys are just coming to Egypt for food. But God was working out his plan. Even the very people that you're praying for, the very people that you're trying to read, they have no clue what God has in store for. But, but understand, God is still working it out because of your faith and because of your obedience. He says, uh, to preserve a posterity. Posterity means that which is left over. It means remainder. It means remnant. It's oftentimes referred to as to descendants. People that come from us, people that are related to us, people that have relationship with us. Remember in Acts chapter 16, verse 3, when Paul uh, was uh, dealing with the Philippian jailer, they prayed, the jail doors opened, and, the, and, and, and all the doors were open, and all the chains fell off, and the guards looked, they, they thought that all the prisoners were escaping to get ready to kill themselves, because they knew that's what the, the law required for the Roman government, and, if, and in the government that they went, if, if you lose a prisoner, you have to sub subject your life, lose your life, for the fact that you lost that prisoner. And that Philip in jail was about to kill himself until he heard Paul say, don't do that. We're still here. And then he came and bowed down to Paul and, 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 and asked what he must do to be saved. And he got saved. Paul told him, if you believe in Jesus Christ, not only you will be saved. He said, you and your household shall be saved. Amen. Because God never saves anybody just for saving somebody. He always saves you for the purpose of being used, for you to use you to have influence in somebody else's life so that they could get saved. And, he, and, and the text says, I've saved your lives for a great deliverance. Now, this, this, this word deliverance is an interesting word. You're going to watch me because I'm going to unpack each one of these words of deliverance as we go through this text. This word deliverance in Hebrew is a word that's pronounced palata, and it literally means survivor. It means someone or something uh, remaining or someone who has escaped or someone who has been spared. In the context of this verse, the word deliverance means that God deliberately made Joseph uh, a survivor so that he could cause his family to survive what they were about to go through. He, he deliberately spared Joseph for what he was going through in order that Joseph might be used to spare his family from the famine. That they, he, he allowed Joseph to escape the consequences of prison, living his life in it, and brought him to the leadership in, in Egypt so that, 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 so that Israel, who God knew would come from the line of Jacob's son, would be escaped from the poverty and from the curtain answered in to bring them to a place where God could raise them up and begin to use them as he sees it. Listen, God seeks to do deliverance in your life because if you remember, God may have you have may have God may have delivered you from something that you were caught up in, delivered you from something that you were bound to, delivered you or something that you know you couldn't get out of yourself and God rescued for you from that. Maybe you did something that you know you shouldn't have done and you know you should have suffered the consequences for it, but God spared you the consequences because he wanted your life to be a testimony to other lives how he can work deliverance in theirs because he did it for you you are you survived the stuff you've been through you stand here today a testament of god's power and grace because you know if it had not been for god you wouldn't be where you are today he didn't just give you survival for you He's using you as an example to those watching you. If you can survive, they can do. If they can put their trust in you, get him like you put your trust in him. Deliverance is a promise and deliverance of posterity. Pray. Don't get, forget praying for them kids, grandkids, grand, great, great. Don't forget praying for them spouses. Don't, don't keep praying. God didn't promise you they will say, be saved. And listen, stop looking for them to come the way you expect them to come. Because yeah, that's what frustrates you. That's what gets you disappointed because you keep expecting them to get delivered the way you expect them to get delivered. 
you expect him to come this way, and God going God to do it whole, totally different. His thoughts are not ours. His ways are not ours. His, as high as our heavens are, brothers, or his thoughts. But God got a whole you way with it. Have even entered into our mind how he going to bring them back. Amen. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He going to work it that when they come back, they ain't going to leave no more. He done promised you that. He done promised that in your prostate. He done promised that for you in your deliverance. That's, that's the power that resides in you. Not only are you delivered, you have the power to bring deliverance, but your deliverance coming to other people's lives as you're walking out. What God has done for second is permanent preservation. Not only is there promised, promised posterity, our deliverance is always for someone else to be delivered. There is a permanent preservation. Psalms 32. Verse 7. Interesting. This is one of the seven penitential psalms that's in the book of Psalms. Penitential literally means penitent, repentant, or, or remorse or sorrow. This is one of those seven penitential psalms where David writes something in the context of the sin that he committed with Bathsheba before even after Nathan had, or even before Nathan came to talk to him, he would immediately felt the conviction of God, and he was writing in this song the feelings that he was feeling. Yet, when you read this psalm, it is not only seems like it's a psalm of sorrow and asking God to forgive him of sin, but it seems like it was a song of jubilation and joy, because the first two verses seem penitential, but then in sprinkled throughout the verses, Paul begins to shout and begins to get excited, not only about the fact that he that that God was God is there, but God will forgive him. Amen. And the verse that we are looking at is one of those jubilant statements Paul makes in the midst of his repentance, in the midst of his sorrow, in the midst of his turning from his sin, he, he says, one thing I know, I know I've done wrong. I know I messed up. I know I blew it. I know I haven't been all that you want me to be, and I'm not doing what you want me to do, but you shall hide me. <laughs> he said, you, you are my hiding place. I ain't got no place else to go. Only one I got to is to go to you. You are the only one I can turn to in the, in the midst of what I'm going through and, and what I've done and how I've messed up. You are my hiding place. And then, then he says, and, and listen, and you shall preserve me from trouble. And then he said, I, I, I'm going to get to it. I'm just letting it sink in. And then he said, you shall surround me with songs of deliverance. Now, 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 now wait a minute. I didn't just sin and blew it. I done messed up. I have disappointed you. But as I think about who you are and I think about what you do, I know I can come to you. You are my hiding place. Hebrew words, you are my covering. You are my shelter. <laughs> you are the one that surrounds. Listen, listen. I know I blow it, but I know recognize this. Even though I don't blow it, I don't want to be anyplace else. But under the shadow of your wing, I want to be covered by you. Because, yeah, I know I'm wrong. I know I ain't right. But that's what? If I go anyplace else, I'm not going to get what you're going to give me. You are my hiding place. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would love to hide from the sin. I would love to wish I never did this sin. But guess what? I can hide in you and experience your forgiveness. And even if everybody else knows, as long as you have forgiven me, I'm all right. You are my hiding place. You are my covering. You are my protection. You are my refuge. David mentions this again in Psalms 119, verse 114, when he says, you are my hiding place and my shield. And, and listen, and I hope in your word. So look, 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 let's, let's get this clear. What is your hiding place right now? When you, when you know you need to go someplace and run, you know you need to go someplace and, and hide. When you know you need God's protection and you know you need God's blessing and you know you need God's favor, you know you need God's grace, you know you need, where is your hiding place? I'm going to tell you where it is. It's in the word. 
It's in the Word. That, that's where you're going to find it. Uh, you may not have a place you can go to, but you got the Word of God. And if you are willing to stand on the Word and obey the Word and do what the Word said, David said, my hope is in the Word. I know you will hide me. I know you'll protect me, but I know where I'm going to get my restoration. It's coming from the Word. It's coming from the Word. You are my hiding place. You are my covering. You are one to keep me, but I know I can. I, I, I'm gonna get kept if I stay in the Word. <laughs> he says, "You preserve me. You keep me. You watch over me. You protect me." And then he says, "And you surround me." <laughs> you know what? I love God. Why I love God so much? Because He don't act like us. I'm serious. I mean, we don't act like that. Listen, if, if we did the stuff to each other that we do to God, we, would be, we wouldn't be looking to surround you with no song. <laughs> no, I, I'd be looking to see what I can do to make you feel how you make me feel. But in spite of us, Seeing our potential, not our problem. Rather than withdraw, he surrounds. It is, it, it, we have an example of that in, in our culture. We do, we do, we do. A mother and her children. When they blow it, mess up. Daddy might get disappointed and walk away. Mom going to run to him. Mom going to get around him. Mom going to try to find out what got you there. Then mom going to try to figure out how to get you out of there. <laughs> See, that's the heart of God when, you, when mama does that for us. Because you, you, man, you know, we know, we know when I'm blue, we can't talk to dad. Dad ain't answering the phone. But mama going to always answer the phone. And mama going to talk to me and say stuff I don't want to hear, but she going to always answer the phone. And listen, God is trying to tell you he's like your mother. He, this, he, he ain't going to never abandon you. He ain't going to never run out on you. He ain't going to never give up on you. Well, when, yeah, when you run to him, he surrounds you. He's going to tell you what you need to hear, but he's going to surround you. He's going to hold you and he's going to keep you. He's going to protect you. He's going to, listen, listen, he, David said, David said in, in Psalms 34, verse 7, he said, he said this, and the angel of the Lord shall encamp all around those who, who fear him and delivers them. Because the only reason God surrounds me, he's not surrounding me to, 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 to give, to give, to, to placate my sin or to, or to give a, a condonance of my sin or to approve my, he ain't surrounding me to do that. He's surrounding me to get me out of it. He's surrounding me to deliver me. He's delivering from me. He's surrounding me to make sure that the enemy don't destroy me, but he's going to chase me and get me back to where I need to be because his intent in his deliverance is that he won't give up on me. His intent in his deliverance is he won't turn his back on me. His intent in his deliverance is to make me become what he has ordained I, I should be from the foundations of the world. He, said he will encamp his angels around you if you fear him. Listen, listen, listen. You can't pull the wool over God's eyes. God knows if you fear him just because you say you fear him don't mean God believe you God knows if you fear him or not yes he does so you, you be, be clear you better make sure you fear him what does that mean, Pastor? That means you reverence him. You make him priority in your life. You make him the number one person in your life. You, you recognize who he is and you submit to his lordship in your life. That's what it means to fear him. That's what it means to reverence him. That means and not just not just quake and terror of him, but you should be afraid. Amen. Uh, literally, you should be. Consequences for disobedience ain't pretty. And I don't know any child. Well, maybe there might be some that take that back. I was a child, let me put it that way. I was a child who hated consequences. <laughs> I was a child when my parents showed me at least once or twice 
that they were going to follow through with what they said. I was a child that learned quick. I don't want that no more. And so, 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 so I understood what I needed to do not to deal with consequences. And, and listen, my brothers and sisters, God will chasten those who fear him, who love him, who reverence him. And if you are in something and you ain't feeling convicted, you in something and you ain't feeling chastened, you in something and your chest is stuck out and you dare people to talk to you about it. <laughs> you might say you're a Christian. <laughs> you might say you love the Lord. But if you can do that and still feel all right, I got some news for you. You ain't his. You ain't his. As much as I see these bad kids in the grocery store falling out on the ground in front of their parents, and I know what I would do with mine if they did that, I can't do it to them because they ain't mine. They ain't mine. They don't belong to me. And if you can have a fit and go and do sin and, and not feel bad and sit up in church and think you all right, you don't belong to him. Because I'm telling you, if you're his, you can't be comfortable doing what you're doing, you, and you know it's sin. Because your father ain't going to let you get away with it. Hello, lights. Oh, well, well, let me move on. I know. I got I to gotta get, get back on the happy trail. Okay, so he says he surrounds you with songs. The word songs is an interesting word. It's literally translated shouts of joy. So listen. Listen, God said, God, God, David, David says in the text, you are my hiding place. Uh, you, he says, and you will, you will preserve me by trouble and you will surround me with songs of deliverance, shouts of joy for deliverance, cries of joy for deliverance, ringing out of your heart. Praise to God for what he has done and what he is doing with you and through you. That, that word deliverance here is different from the word we read in, saw in Genesis. The word here is pellet, and it literally means to be free. It means to bring out. It means to save. So listen, he's going to surround me with songs or shouts of joy because of how he set me free how he's brought me out of what I was in, how he has saved me from what I could have been in. He will surround me with song, with, 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 with those songs. Those songs are going to not only come from the angels, they're going to come from me. Have you caught yourself just walking through the house singing? You hadn't planned it. You just started. Do you know that's a byproduct of deliverance, right? The byproduct of deliverance is that your heart, your soul sings out and shouts to the Lord for where you are and for what it recognizes you. He's doing for you and doing in you. The part of that preservation, part of that, that, that keeping me, part of that keeping me where I am is that I constantly recognize on a regular basis how God is working out his deliverance in my life. And as a result, I don't just recognize it intellectually. I recognize it emotionally and spiritually. And my, my, my whole being can't help but react to it because I recognize it's not just something stagnant in my mind. It's something real in my life. The promise of deliverance, the, 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 what the byproduct of deliverance is that there's a promised posterity. The byproduct of deliverance is that there is permanent preservation. And the permanent preservation comes from the fact that God has, has delivered me and I'm, and I'm recognizing deliverance in my life. And because I recognize that deliverance in my life, the reciprocal response to that deliverance is to praise him. And when I begin to praise him, that only reinforces the deliverance that's in me. 
And it becomes that cycle in the spirit realm where I worship him and praise him and he confirms my deliverance. And that cycle of deliverance that continues to work out in my life becomes manifested in my life physically. Now, people begin to question what you look like and how you act. How come you can do that? Why can you pray? How come you have so much peace and what you why? How come you can't react to that? How I react because I can't help it when I think about what he's doing and what he's done. The circumstances. Yeah, they ain't right. I don't like them. I don't want to be here. But when I think about who he is and what he can do and how he can do it, even though he ain't done it yet. I know he will do it. So in the meantime, I can give him some praise. Deliverance brings promised posterity. Deliverance brings permanent preservation. Deliverance brings paternal protection. I love this proverb. I don't know why. I'm always drawn to this proverb. Proverb says in 21:30, the horse is prepared. For the day of battle. But <laughs> I like to stop right there. The horse is prepared for the day of battle. Let, let, let me help you. Back in the day when men uh, in that time go to war, one of the things they needed to depend on was the reliability of the horses they rode. Because heading into battle on horseback required the horse to have a certain level of training and mindset. That they couldn't be riding a horse that the sound of clanging steel and shooting arrows would get skittish and turn around and run away. It, he had to be, he had, he couldn't depend on a horse that when a spear may have scraped his nose or stuck itself in the chest, that it would fall, that, that would quickly win it and bail it and run off the other way. It had to rely on a horse that no matter how hot the battle got, that when he would tell that horse to ride forward, it would keep on riding forward. When he would, when he would kick his spear, spurs into the side of that horse and tell it to go faster, it would move. Regardless of what's going on around it, regardless of what it sees, regardless of what it hears, it will stand and it will do what the rider on the back will tell it to do. Men became dependent on, on their horses. And their steeds, when they could rely on them in battle. So much so in some of the cultural, in some of the secular cultures of the day, they even had worship to certain horses who prevailed in battle and did great things as far as their writers and their masters were concerned. Men took a lot of time and great effort in choosing a horse for battle became dependent upon the physical ability of their horse to even deliver them in the midst of a fight. So God's not addressing something that's foreign to them when he makes the statement, the horse is prepared for the day of battle. Because he, he's, a, he's, he's addressing a mindset of trust in material things. Y'all may not be a horse. Your might, yours might be your own intellect. You think you're smarter than God. You think you know better in your situation what to do than what God's word says. Because you think that's going to deliver you. You think that's going to work out for you. It may not be your intellect, so it may be your finances. You think if you hold your money and do what you, with your money what you want rather than what God tells you to do with your money, you won't have more money. And you have the kind of money you need to take care of yourself. And it, it, even though God's word tells you how to handle your money and tells you what to do with your money and tells you who your money really belongs to, you still rely on your in, idea and understanding and intellect as it relates to how to handle your finances. It's your horse. Okay. 
all of us got horses that we ride on in our culture. Some of us have learned to change steeds. <laughs> get off the back of that one and get on one that's going to take me where he really needs to go. I'm trying to help you understand that, 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 that too many of us rely too much on what's in our hand, what we have the ability to control. That's what the proverb is referring to. Matter of fact, matter of fact, uh, in uh, Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 23, Jeremiah puts it this way. He says, truly in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills or from the multitude of mountains. Truly in the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel. Again, material thing. They felt the higher they could build their cities on a hill, the better protected they would be. They felt the higher the walls they could put around their cities, the better protected they'd be. The closer to mountains that they could be with their cities, the better protected their cities would be. They were relying on the physical things of the world to provide for them the protection and the deliverance that only God can give. And the challenge to you today, my brothers and sisters, is I believe we come to close of this message on you got the power. That you got to recognize that your power does not lie in the stuff that you have in your hand. Your power does not come from how well you can manage the things of this world that you bring into your, into your scope of influence. Your power does not lie in your ability to do anything that the world says is all right for you to do. Your power lies for your deliverance, for the deliverance of your family, for the deliverance of the things that you're trying to do in your life. I don't care whether you're trying to succeed on your job, whether you're trying to get a raise. I don't care why you're accomplish an education, whether you're trying to do things in the world that are going to bring you great fame and glory. I'm telling you, the only way you're going to get to that place, the only way you're going to see that thing happen is by, by accessing the power that lies in you. And that power comes only from God. He will deliver. He can deliver. And he does deliver. He says, the horse is prepared for the day of battle, but deliverance. That Hebrew word is the word tesua. It can be translated help, salvation, and victory. My victory in my deliverance comes from no place else but God. Listen, 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 listen carefully. Listen. I'm closing, I'm coming closer. In the church, amongst those of us who call ourselves believers, we rely too much on the advice from the world to overcome the circumstances that we are in. I know believers who still read their horoscope every day. It might not be some of y'all, but I know believers. I know believers who feel they seeking counsel from the world will help them navigate the circumstances in their life. I know believers who think that if they can just get a leg up on this situation, that they could just leverage it by putting themselves in the right position with the right people and in the right circumstance, that the thing that they're trying to do will happen. And I, listen, I ain't talking about unsafe folk. I'm talking about believers. And the only time they call God. It's when it ain't working the way they want it to work. Can I give you a word of advice? And, that's, and this, is, this is what I'm closing. 
The last aspect of deliverance is that there is paternal protection. When you tell your father, you don't need him to protect you because you got it. And when you got it doesn't work out. You now want to run back to your father for protection. Can I give you a word of advice? Be ready to do what he expects, not what you expect. Because if you're going back to him, he's not going to reject you. When you run back to him, he's not going to, he's not going to kick you out. When you run back to him, his arm's going to be open wide. But when you run back to him, please, if you want to experience his power, you want to experience his deliverance, you want to have the victory, you want to be the overcomer, you want to be the head and not the tail. When you run back to him, run back to him with the expectation of letting him do it his way. I had a whole big ending, but I think God wants me to say, God is not your glorified Santa Claus. He's not your lucky rabbit's foot. And he's not your lucky charm. He is God. He is a deity. He is personal. He is real. He is omnipresent and omnipotent. He is not something that you pull off the shelf, rub it, and get what you want and put it back on the shelf. There are expectations he has of you. There are standards he expects you to fulfill. And there are, there are commands that he's expecting you to obey. And if you want to experience his power in your life, stop dictating to him. Because he doesn't respond to your dictation. Start obeying him. Start doing what you know you're supposed to do and start doing it consistently in your life. And you will see the power of God. You will not only see the power of God, you will feel the presence of God. Not only will you feel the presence of God, you will see the miracles of God manifest in your life. But you've got to make up your mind. You got to get off your agenda and get on his. You got to get out of your plan and start lining up with his. And you got to decide that when you do this, no matter how rough it gets along the way, that you're going to stick to it because you know God's going to do what he says he will do. Deliverance. I don't know anybody here that don't want to experience deliverance. I don't know anybody here that don't want, that don't want deliverance. But you got to understand, if you're going to experience the deliverance that God talks about in the Bible, you got to be willing to come and stand on his agenda and stand in his plan and let him do it his way. Because I promise you, I promise you, I promise you with all that's in me and everything that the word of God says, if you'll do it his way, everything you read about in the word that happens to the saints of God who obey him will be manifested in your life. Oh, yes, it will, because God's not a respecter of persons. He's just waiting for folks to obey him. And the question is, will you? All his bowed and all eyes closed. And thank you for joining us in our worship today. And the message you've heard this morning, I trust that as you've listened to it and you've heard the preacher and the speaker uh, lay out the principles, it might be that you might want to have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, because again, the key to all the pl- applying of all these principles in our lives is knowing Jesus as your savior. And listen, here's an opportunity for you to do that right now. If you will bow your heads and pray with me and receive Jesus as your savior. Listen, there is no greater dis- choice or decision you can make than the one you've made today based on what you've heard. Say, Lord Jesus, I need you. I thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I open the door of my heart and I receive you as my Savior and my Lord. Take control of my life. Forgive me of my sins and fill me with your spirit. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 
Listen, if you prayed that with me this morning, welcome to the family. QR code is appearing on the screen right now. You can scan that QR code with your device. It's going to take you to a page where you can fill out information for us to contact you and for us to give you insight, information that will help you now grow and become closer and more intimate in your relationship with the Lord. If your device is not available to scan, go to the website you see there, www.ecclesiachurch.com. Go just below the introductory banner and you'll see a series of icons. In there, it'll say online church, it'll say YouTube, it'll say Facebook, but to your far right, it'll it'll have a symbol of praying hands. Click on that. It'll take you to the same page and listen and go down and fill out that information that the box that you want to click for both of them is that you pray to receive Christ. Give us that information, hit submit, and somebody will contact you from our ministry and tell you what your next steps are. Again, God bless you. Thank you for tuning in to our broadcast, being a part of our online ministry experience, and continue to watch us at ECF Online or join us each morning at our 714 Prayer Focus, and that's at ECF Online if you type that in your search engine on YouTube or on Facebook. God bless you. You all have a blessed day. Thank you for joining and being a part of the ministry of Ecclesia Christian Fellowship. God bless you.